Hi, I'm Levi, and I recently decided that I want to build a robotic arm. I wanted to start with something relatively simple, so I thought I'd make a Scara arm. If you're unaware, a Scara arm is a robotic arm with two linkages that rotate parallel to the ground plane. They're connected end to end, so the end point can move anywhere on the plane, and there's typically a linear actuator involved so that it can move throughout the z-axis. What I ended up making is technically a 5R 2 degree of freedom parallel robot, uh, which is not a Scara arm, but the motion is constrained in the same way and the end result is pretty similar. So I'm just gonna keep calling it a Scara arm. That's what the file's called and I'm not changing it. At the end of the day, what I really wanna do is make a fun platform to play around with some inverse kinematics. And this Scara arm should be an excellent application for that. So let's begin with the design of this robot. The goal of this project was pretty loose, so that meant that there were a lot of fun design decisions to make going into it. I always want my robots to be strong, so I knew I wanted some gearboxes on the motors. A gearbox would also benefit me because reducing the speed means that I have some more fine control on the output because motors are generally too fast to be useful in most applications. There are many kinds of gearboxes and gear reduction systems, but there's one that has always been my favorite, and that is of course the cycloidal drive. So I designed two identical cycloidal drives to act as the two main actuators for this robot. I've designed and explained many of these in the past, so I'm not gonna go into an in-depth explanation here, but if you're unfamiliar, I'll give you a quick update. The gist of a cycloidal drive is that you have an external facing gear inside of an internal facing gear, and this internal facing gear has one more tooth than the external one. The internal gear is not rotated, but is instead wobbled in a cyclic motion by the rotating input shaft. The wobbling motion of the internal gear then engages it with the external gear, and then for each one revolution of the input, the output gear will shift by one tooth. These are not traditional involute gears, they're very far from it. In order to get the inner gear to fit inside of the outer gear nicely, it has to be a very specific geometry, and that's where this kind of lobe shape comes from. Beyond these cycloidal gearboxes, I just need some linkages to connect to an output. And even though the endpoint of this robot is not directly coupled to any motor or motor output, it is fully constrained by the two motors. In fact, each set of unique angles that the motors can turn to correspond to one unique position for the endpoint. Let's say that this is a top-down view of two motors, with the axes of rotation denoted by the points. Each motor will have a linkage connected to their output that goes off at some angle. So here's one linkage, and here's another linkage. Now the question is, where is the endpoint? And we can figure out where the endpoint is by drawing some circles. There's another linkage that connects this point and some unknown endpoint, and it has a known length. If we draw a circle with a radius equal to the length of that linkage, this circle represents all possible endpoints as constrained by this arm alone. We can do the same thing with the other arm. We know the endpoint is on this circle and this circle, so it has to be where they coincide. Now there's two solutions here. This one would require the machine to collide with itself, so we know it's not there. That means the endpoint is at this position, and we expect the one linkage to go like that, and the other linkage to be at that angle. That's how we constrain the position in a plane with two rotational motors. We've discussed my design intent and some of the theory behind how this thing is supposed to work, so here is the completed CAD model. The cycloidal drives are housed inside of these two black casings back here. If I turn on a section view, we can get a look inside them to see the mechanism. You can also clearly see the linkage structure that we drew on the whiteboard, especially from the top view. Something to note is that I left the end position open here. This is so that in the future, if I want to design something to attach to here, I have the space to do so. Other than that, the main takeaway here is that this thing looks awesome, and I am very excited to put it into reality. Before we get to building this thing, I wanna take a minute to talk about what is the single most important tool in my engineering toolbox, and that is CAD software. This video is sponsored by Onshape, which is a professional full-featured CAD software that can run in your browser on any device. This entire project was designed with Onshape and doing so was honestly a breeze. Onshape is not limited by the fact that they run in a browser, in fact it enables them to do a lot of cool things. Onshape handles rendering locally so that everything can remain buttery smooth on your end, and then it handles all the complex computations on their server side. Onshape allows you to do stuff like FEA or product rendering that normally takes a long time super quickly because it's running it on like $10,000 GPUs. 
Onshape is also designed with collaboration and workflow in mind. Since it is browser-based, Onshape can make file sharing extremely easy. Send someone a link and they can access it depending on the permissions you give them. Onshape also has a full featured app. So anything you can do with the normal software, you can do on an iPad in the field if you need to. Great for reference, great for editing on the go. On top of that, it also has built in part release system and build materials generator. One of my favorite things with it, especially relating to collaboration, is that Onshape has a branch version tree. This is a workflow that programmers have been benefiting from for a long time, and now finally we can get it in CAD software too. All in all, Onshape is optimized for the fast-paced collaborative design environment. It's built for a modern workflow and it's designed to help you get product to market faster than ever. So thank you to Onshape for sponsoring this video. There's gonna be a link in the description for you to start a free trial. I highly recommend you give it a shot. Now let's put the tool to use and make this SCAR robot. Unsurprisingly, most of this project is 3D printed. As per usual, I'm printing in standard PLA on my Ender 3 V2. However, there were some structural elements that I knew I wanted to be stronger than a 3D print. So I ordered some custom aluminum parts that would be cut from quarter inch plate. And I'm very happy with how these turned out. These, these aluminum parts are even prettier than I was expecting. And that's not to mention the dimensional accuracy. These parts are more accurate than I thought was possible with laser cutting. I thought I'd have to adjust at least a couple of the prints to compensate for tolerance issues, but nothing. It was all just a perfect fit right out of the box. I've got all my individual parts collected and 3D printed, and I've got a whole box of hardware, and now I just need to turn all of this into that. I've been looking forward to this for a while, so this should be fun. I'm going to start by assembling one of the sides without the outer piece so you can see the internal mechanism. This is what one of the cycloidal drives looks like without the outer casing. The red part is the cycloidal disc, and in this configuration, it actually doesn't rotate at all. When I turn the motor, you can see that the red disc doesn't rotate, it just wobbles in a circular motion. This design has four thick shoulder bolts that go all the way through the mechanism. The cycloidal gear has four oversized holes that the shoulder bolts go through. Not only are these bolts holding everything together, but they are constraining the rotation of the gear. As this gear wobbles around in place, it will then engage with the corresponding lobes on the inside of the output. This outer casing acts as the output gear and will translate the wobbling motion of the cycloidal gear into a slow high torque rotation. Now that you've gotten a look at what the inside of this mechanism looks like, I'm going to put it together for real. Final assembly. It's always fun, but it's also always more difficult than you expect. I think we can all agree that this looks damn good. I'm already happy with it and I haven't even made it move yet. Now that the robot is built, we have to worry about inverse kinematics. So I, I figure I should explain what inverse kinematics is first. But in order to explain inverse kinematics, I need to explain forward kinematics. Forward kinematics is basically what we discussed before. Again, we have a representation of two motors. Each has an arm attached to it. These arms have linkages and the linkages go to some endpoint. The idea of forward kinematics is to say, I know the angle that these two motors are at. Based off of these two angles, where do I expect the end position to be? That's forward kinematics, but there's a problem with that, and the problem is that it's not very useful. If I'm trying to demonstrate fine control, I start with a desired end position, and from there, I need to figure out what angle I need to turn the motors. So the idea is I'm given some end position, and I need to figure out what angle these motors need to turn to in order to facilitate that end position. So this is the opposite of forward kinematics. It's still a nonlinear mathematical function, but it takes an input of a position and outputs two corresponding motor angles. So here's the problem. We have two motors, one end position. We need to figure out how to get from here to there. I'm gonna start by simplifying the problem and that's by getting rid of the top motor. We're just gonna focus on the bottom one. I'm gonna begin by doing what we did earlier and drawing circles that represent sets of solutions. We know the length of the motor arm according to the CAD and we can use that as a radius to draw a circle. Similarly, we know the length of the outer linkage and we can use that as another radius about the endpoint. We know that the point that these two linkages connect lies on the intersection of these two curves. Always expect the, the linkages to bend outwards on the arms, otherwise they might collide. So that means is we expect this point to be where the linkages meet. 
We know this length as the length of the motor arm, and we know this length as the length of the outer linkage. There's another crucial known variable here, and that is the distance between these two points. What we found here is a triangle, and triangles can be great for our calculations. Remember that the goal here is to calculate the angle that this motor needs to turn to. So it would be useful to know this angle at least as a starting point. We can calculate the value of theta 1 by simply using the law of cosines. But theta 1 alone is not enough to calculate the absolute angle of our first motor. We want an angle relative to a fixed position. If I bring a line straight horizontal, so that's 0 degrees, I create a right triangle. I can use the definition of sine to calculate theta 2. I expect the total angle to be theta 2, which at least in this case is going to be a negative value, minus theta 1. Theta 1 is always going to be positive, and this is a negative angle in total, so we expect it to be overall negative. The actual math looks something like this. So these equations are the inverse kinematic model for our robot. Now we need to actually apply them. This is the complete code for my SCARA robot. The actual math for the inverse kinematic model is only these two functions down here. But as you can see, there's a lot more to the program than just that. And that's because there is another pretty significant issue here that we have to overcome with the code. And that's an issue of linearization. Given only a defined start and end position, there is a tendency for the robot to move along an arc. If the motors are moving at a constant speed since they are rotating, this makes sense. It's going to be some kind of elliptical or circular arc. But that's not what I want. What I want is a linear movement. So how do I go from this to something more like a line? I want to linearize this curve. So instead of doing that complex speed manipulation, I will instead just break up the set of points into shorter distance points. Instead of only two points here at a great distance, I could have several points that are at shorter distances. Now the robot's tendency will still be to arc from one point to another, but since the points are pretty close together, the arcs will be pretty shallow, and in the end, it'll end up looking pretty much like a line. As the points become more and more frequent, the limit will approach a straight line. And it actually doesn't take that many points for the human eye to start perceiving this as linear. So this is the final project, fully built and now fully programmed. This is the hardware, it's very simple. It's just an Arduino Nano connected to four buttons arranged in a D-pad. The electronics are made really simple here because the stepper motors I'm using already have these closed feedback driver boards bolted to the bottom of them. You can kind of see them attached down there. That's why there's so many connecting wires here. With these edit control boards, all I need to do to control the motors is give it a step signal and a direction signal. And they'll even increase or decrease the torque of the motors depending on the load on the output. Something that I spent a lot of time thinking about for this robot is how I wanted to zero it. My initial thought was that I would use some limit switches and put, mount them on the frame here somewhere to determine a, a zero position. But as I thought about it more, I realized that a robot like this does not have a true zero position. The arms can't go straight outwards to either side because then it would collide with itself. So that's not a true zero. So you could put limit switches at this point and call this zero, but there are certain orientations where certain arms will go beyond that point. So it's not a true zero. So since there isn't a true zero here, and since these motors do not have absolute positioning, I decided that I would just have you do some manual zeroing when you start up the program. I'll hit my power supply to turn it on to 12 volts here. Nothing moves. Two pairs of buttons on my D-pad will correspond to movements on the motors. And I'll start by turning my motors so that both of them point straight forward and they're parallel. I designed a couple notches in these 3D printed pieces that you can line up, but for the most part, I just eyeball it and it's good enough. Once we're at the starting position, I need to tell the robot that we are fully zeroed. And I do so by pressing two of the buttons at the same time. So it moved to a pre-programmed starting position and now I'm able to control the endpoint. My buttons are arranged in a D-pad, and that's because they correspond to directional movements. Since I have the inverse kinematic model and my linearization program, I can move the endpoint in lines in any direction according to the corresponding button press. So I'll move it forwards, and then backwards. And you see that the motors are moving together to make this linear motion happen. What's more interesting is left movement and the right movement because the motors have to vary their speed independent of each other. So this is what I've been going for the whole time. I wanted to build a robot with two rotary inputs that can output linear motion. And you can clearly see that's what's happening. I really like the downward perspective. This is, this is a cool view.
It can even reach beside itself. I think that this is pretty damn cool, and the, the motion is, is kind of mesmerizing to watch. It's very, it's very fun. I should, however, address what's probably the elephant in the room. There are two big issues with this, and the first one is, as you can probably see, backlash. There is a very significant amount of backlash in both of these actuators. This is not a product of the mechanical design, this is really just a product of my 3D printer. The X and Y axes of my 3D printer are not very well dialed in, so I, I always expect every circle to be slightly elliptical. Because of that, I printed the cycloidal gears slightly undersized. The result of that is some slop in the mechanism. But I didn't explicitly need precision for this, I just wanted to demonstrate the linear motion, so the wobbliness doesn't really affect me, and I'm okay with it. The other issue is something that you might be able to hear as well as see, and that's the crunchiness of the movement. The endpoint feels very jittery when it moves around, not just because of the backlash. And of course, the backlash makes it worse, but I think there's another issue here that has to do with the computational capacity of my hardware. I am using an Arduino Nano here, and that is almost as small and simple of a microcontroller as you can get a hold of. And I'm asking a lot of this hardware. Inverse trig functions can be pretty difficult for a computer to do, and I'm asking this one to do multiple inverse trig functions around 20 times a second. So what I believe is happening here is it will move smoothly for about 1 20th of a second, and then at that point it completely stops, does some calculations, does some thinking, and then will again move smoothly for the next 20th of a second. But even with those two limitations, you can very clearly see that we are moving linearly here. The inverse kinematic model is definitely working, even if it is pretty heavy on the, on the computing side. So I'm not too bummed out about this. I, I'm not surprised by these limitations at all. It's still very fun to play with and it gets the point across. So there you go, that's my first Scara arm. In fact, it's my first attempt at any kind of robotic arm. I am a bit disappointed by the backlash and I could definitely benefit from some more computationally powerful hardware, but in the end I'm, I'm still very happy with it. I was able to combine two rotational inputs to get a linear motion on the output and that's, that's really what I was looking for coming into this. And it looks great, it's just a sexy thing, especially those aluminum plates it turned out great. Visually, I cannot complain. I'm definitely going to be using more aluminum plates like that in projects going forward. If you followed me or my channel, you might know that it's been like a year and a half since the last video, and no, this Scara arm did not take me a year and a half to build. It took me like a month to build. The last year and a half or so have been pretty busy. It's included my first year of college, and now I'm second year. I also did an internship at JPL, so I haven't had a lot of time to work on projects. I do have a much bigger space to accommodate working on projects now, and I do intend to be back with many more videos. So if you like what I did here, you like the kind of stuff I work on, uh, you can support me and my work over on Patreon. There's a link for that in the description. It's always a ton of fun building a robot, and this big chunky thing is absolutely no exception. I will be back here on YouTube more. This was just the beginning of my return, um, but it is all I have for you for now. So thanks for watching, bye.